Good morning. Get my act together here now. Um, I still get nervous. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Every Sunday, you know, and I think, oh, nobody's going to come. And what did I say wrong last week to thin out everybody? And uh, God, don't let me say something this week I'm not supposed to. And oh, that person didn't say hi to me. I probably pissed them off or something. <laughs> Oh, and don't let me say pissed in church. I, I just can't help it. I don't. And, of course, I've always been one of these people that, like, well, you must not be as good a Christian as me if, you're, if you worry. Right? They've got this tear system going, right? So if you worry, you're less of a Christian than somebody else. Uh, let's, let's not go there. But anyway, I, I do get nervous. I want to teach you right and I, and I want to I wanna preach to you right, and I want our music to be right. I want everything right. And I've been on this kick about getting you to read your Bibles. And, of course, this just opens up another can of worms of some of the text people are using out of context. They're kind of abusing the text. And so when I get you to read your Bibles, you come up with a lot of questions, and I love it. I'm good with the questions. But I want to make sure that you... Understand what the culture is. You know, I'm a big culture person. So if you don't understand the context and what's going on, you're not going to really get out of the, the passage what you think it says. And I'm going to give you a couple examples to try to keep you reeled in so when you read your Bible, you won't just take a line out of there and use it for yourself when it means something completely different. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, I heard the ladies, I think, talking about uh, I'm probably going to butcher this. Jethro. Jethro was a, a warrior, Old Testament warrior. And he was going to go into the battle with the uh, Ammonites. And he, he, he prayed to God to have them given to him and that he would defeat them. And he actually went as far as to say, if you hand them over to me, Whatever the first thing that comes out of the front door is, I will sacrifice it to you. Okay, you got to have a little culture here first, right? Some of the animals and stuff that they had, now this goes back to your Christmas thing and were the animals in a barn or a stable. They had like these caves and they would live in one part in the animal. So this is not uncommon for an animal to be coming out of somebody's front door because they kind of all lived as one. He goes home and... His daughter is the first thing that walks out the door. Uh-huh. And you right away think that he sacrificed his daughter because he says, I did what I told him I would do. And she even says, because he tells her what he did, and the daughter even says, you know what, it's okay. Let me have, I think it was three months, to go off into the field, and because I'm never going to get a chance to marry... You guys all right now think that he killed his daughter, don't you? And it doesn't say that. It does not. Sacrificing to the Lord does not necessarily mean kill. In fact, the law that was written 200 years prior to this story says we will not do human sacrifices. Why would he sacrifice his daughter? And when she says, I'll never get a chance to marry, this would indicate that he sacrificed his daughter to the tabernacle, to the... Um, Levites who took care of the tabernacle and that she would go to work there, be dedicated to God, and she would never marry. And everybody thinks he killed his daughter. Then this goes on to Abraham, right? Abraham is told to go and sacrifice Isaac. And all oh, you people read this and they say, how can God do this? You know, and he built a fire and he got ready to stab him and everything. And then the, the ram appears in the bush, right? Do you know this story? you got to go back a little bit further where Abraham was promised by God that he would build a nation greater than the sand on the beach. Abraham knew God would not let him sacrifice his son. Even if he did sacrifice, he would have resurrected him or something because he was going to build the Israelites based on Isaac. So don't think these things are all weird and how God has sacrifice in children. So I tell you that I stand up here and I'm nervous every week, all the time. And of course, you're thinking, 
now maybe not you, but some deep-rooted, these, these good Christians that are clear up here, they're better than everybody, would say, you shouldn't worry. If, if you're worried about something, you need to either pray more or something. You, know, you shouldn't worry. And then they say that it says, do not worry. And if you read your Bibles and knew what the context was and what the culture was, you'd know that the, the Philippi, the Philippi people had just lost Paul. He'd been put into prison. Their own pastor that they sent to take care of him got sick and was not coming back. And they were scared to death that the church was going to fail. And he says, don't worry. Just follow what God has. Don't be anxious about anything. God will take care of it. So then we take this thing that says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't have any anxiety because that's what it says. When you're not, you're not talking about the story that's going on. So when I get up here and feel nervous, I'm kind of like, okay, I just got to open my mouth and God, you speak through me because I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm scared to death and these people are looking at me and the lights are in my eyes. I can't even see who's out here. You know, what, somebody's waving, right? Make sure my flies... All right, I got to go through a list here. Does that make me less of a Christian than anybody else? It does not. So, do not fear. Fear not. How many times do you see this all over the place? In fact, I got a list here. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not fear again. Over and over and over again. Not supposed to fear, but then he actually shows us some different levels of fear and what fear is. There's one kind of fear that is a reverent, um, awestruck for a person. If you are a God-fearing person, it, not, it doesn't mean you're scared. It means that you hold them in high reverence. But then there's other times when you probably better be scared, <laughs> right? When it says, do not be afraid, wouldn't that mean that you could just run wild? Grace is so great, you don't have to fear your sin. You don't have to fear punishment. You think God really wants that? So, we finished up Easter. Jesus appears outside the tomb. Mary's out there. And I got to tell you, first the angel appears to the guards outside. And the angel has rolled the stone away. And it says that they were so scared, they fainted. And then it goes on to say, and Mary saw him and he said, do not be afraid. Here's two different levels of fear right at the same point. One of them was he was trying to calm. And one of them, he made so scared, they fainted. Okay, so now we know that there's different levels of fear instead of no fear at all. Why would he have told Mary, do not fear? if they, she wasn't supposed to fear. Why is there so much talk about fear if we're not supposed to fear? Why is there so much talk about money if it wasn't an issue? You know, I don't, I don't see in Scripture here, I've been trying to find where it says unicorns aren't real. I'm sorry, is there kids in here? <laughs> unicorns aren't real because... Never mind. You see, when there's a topic that's over and over and over again, it means that this is a lot in our life, that this means a lot, and we need to be taught about it. A good parent, I'm sure just about every one of you has said this, oh, don't worry, right? Your kid's nervous about something, they're going to do something, you say, oh, don't worry. Oh, but daddy, what, what about this and this? It's okay, Abby, don't worry when I'm scared to death, <laughs> right? We comfort our kids this way. And maybe God does the same thing. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. How can you not be scared? How can you not have anxiety? Maybe some of you are so good. And, and you know, we, we have this Davis group that meets here on the first and the third uh, Tuesday. And it is amazing to me. People get to talk about different things and, and what they're going through and how they handle different things. And, and uh, one of the discussions was, where is the line between sadness and depression? 
What, what, what is the line? I mean, in life, there's going to be a certain amount of stress and sadness, right? So what makes it all of a sudden depression instead of just plain sadness? Whose scale are you using? D doesn't everybody have a little worry in their life? So you're worried about something. At what point does it become anxiety? And whose scale are you using? And we came to, to I guess, a kind of a conclusion that if it were to consume your life or affect your way of living, it's probably a little worse than just normal. Then how do we handle it? And it goes on and on. This is natural stuff. Anxiety, worry, and fear all entered our life at the fall of mankind. This was not God's plan. But just like sickness and other things, it now is part of the world, and we have to deal with it. And I am not going to stand up here and tell you that if you have fear, anxiety, or depression, or something like that, that you're any less than anybody else. Who gets to make that call? Who, whose scale are you using to say, okay, you have a mental problem, but he's just nervous. Boy, now I'm picking on you. You used to sit there. And... Uh, who's, who, who gets to make that call? How about whoever gets to make that call, stand at the door every Sunday morning and tell who can come in and who can't, right? You're, you're not good enough to come in, but, oh, but you can come in. Is, are you going to be one of them? You, you shouldn't worry. You know, this person over here just worries just the right amount. They're normal. But you worry too much. You must not have enough faith. You don't pray enough. You're going to make that call? Or are you going to help somebody deal with it? That's Christianity. We comfort others with the same comfort that we received. God equips people to deal with this kind of stuff. And I'm a worry wart. I'll just be honest with you. I worry all the time. And if you think that I'm less of a Christian, because I do, you're in the wrong church. I'm going to lose somebody. <laughs> right? We call this controlled growth. Right? When there's not enough seats left over, I say something like pissed, and <laughs> next week 20 people won't come back, and we can start over again. You're not, you're not a good enough pastor. You're not one of them real pastors. You're lost. Well, we got this level, right? Have some more cake. I'm telling you, we have to deal with these things instead of tell somebody that they're less than. Um, I had one of these fathers just like, uh, uh, you got to get your act together. You know, uh, I'm trying to not say bad words here. Uh, right? There's something wrong with you. Just go get your act together. You'll be all right. But I wasn't. I needed to talk to somebody. Are you one of those people? Are you one of the people that, like, you're so good that anybody that has any fear or anxiety or something, they, there's something wrong with them. And now we've labeled this as mental health. Right? If you hear this word, you automatically have brought them down here. Mental. As soon as you say it, something wrong with them. So let, let, me, let me tell you this. If you were a diabetic and, and you said, I, I think maybe my sugar's getting low, would you say to them, you just got to get your act together. You got to pray more. You don't have enough faith. Or would you say, dude, take a shot? <laughs> so if we have this fear and this anxiety and stuff, why would you say that to somebody else? Because it is kind of a chemical imbalance. If your body's not producing something that it should, get it fixed. Well, I went on a rant, didn't I? <laughs> I'm feeling so much better, though. <laughs> Phew. So now, now I can tell you guys, next time you have some anxiety or fear or something, just unload on somebody. Right? There's a kind of fear that we need to have, and there's a kind of fear that we don't need to have. And this is where you have to make sure that you know 
what's going on when you're reading your Bibles and what the fear is pertaining to and what it's talking about. Because somebody that has fear and anxiety and all that other stuff is no less than anybody else. And I don't want you to take scripture and abuse it that way. What it does is it's actually damaging. It's actually the bait of Satan that will cause division when maybe you could have been really effective to somebody if you would have just kept your mouth shut or knew what you were talking about. <sighs> Perfect love drives out fear. Um, in 1 John, it actually says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfectly loved. Perfect love drives out fear. So if I fear, I must not have the love that I need. Is that how you read that? Yeah, I must, I got to get some more love somewhere because perfect love drives out fear. And what you don't know is if you don't read further and, and, and study, it's actually talking about perfect love. Perfect in the Greek actually would mean um, complete. So the complete love that we'll never know until we're in the realm with Jesus is what they're talking about. You do not need to worry about being scared to step into the next realm. I understand being scared with the unknown, things that are uncertain. I totally get that. But there's certain fear we do not need to have, and that is salvation. When we step into the next realm, we will have this complete love that we cannot obtain or get here on earth. The perfect love drives out fear. Fear means punishment. If you step into the next realm, you will not have any fear because there will be complete, perfect love there. And there will be no punishment. But I do want you to know that other fear actually will keep you safe. It'll give you wisdom. How does the Holy Spirit guide you and teach you if he, if he wants you to stop doing something? Fear can save lives. So, I'll ask you, you ever had a kid do something wrong and you lay into them? I was so scared that, you know, as soon as my dad was going to get home, we had to have the bikes up out of the driveway. We had to be cleaned up and ready for dinner. We were scared to death. But it taught us respect. And those bikes were picked up. And I get it. I do. You ever do that to your kids? You lay into them so much, and you do it because you love them, and you want to teach them what's right. You want them to have a little fear. You want them to fear so they never do that again. Whatever it was that was so bad. Now, there's going to be some people in here that are better than me that will be able to sit down with their children and say, Now, Billy... Now, Billy, see, we don't, we don't do that here. And here's a trophy for you. And, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And nothing wrong with healthy fear. Now, I'm not, we better make sure the insurance policy is paid up before I say this. But healthy fear is actually good for us. Don't go home and beat your kids. You have to realize that God can use fear as well. And I'm, let me tell you a story about a person that was so fearful, so depressed, had so much anxiety that he turned to God. He had no one else to go to. He didn't know what else to do. Threw himself at God, and God spoke to him. It didn't take it all away, but boy, it sure made him a good person. He gets it now. Did God use that fear for the good of others? Did God cause the fear? I'm not sure I believe that. But he uses everything for good for, for those that love him. If he can put a little fear or allow a little fear in our lives that we will never do that again, wouldn't it benefit, 
benefit the kingdom? I want you to know that it's okay to have fear as long as it doesn't consume you. That would be the time to probably get some help. And I, I personally did. I had to get some help. And I'm not afraid to say, say it. Yes, we have a dog. <laughs> uh, you see, I'm, I'm not a good enough Christian to, to not let the dog in here. He's part of the family. She, part of the family. If it makes you nervous, get your act together. <laughs> you're not praying enough. You don't have enough faith. Or maybe you're just allergic to dogs, and I'm sorry, I'll get the dog out of here. <laughs> Wh which one of those two patterns would be the effective way. And what are you doing? What side of the fence are you on? Somebody just needs to get their act together? Or hey, let me tell you how I handled it. Let me tell you how we handle it with my children, with my parents, with my grandparents. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This seems to work better. But the, the telling people, you just have to have more faith. I don't believe that. It might work for some of you. The apostles are in the boat with Jesus, and he's sleeping. And they are so scared that they go and wake him up and say, Do something! They were scared, and they're in the presence of God. If this was a bad thing, don't you think he would have stood up and said, You've got to get your act together? <laughs> Maybe he did. But instead, he just handled it. And then they all knew. Did God use that fear for good? Or was it a sin that they were fearful? In one part, he actually says, you have little faith. That same little faith is the same as it says a little mustard seed can move a mountain. It actually means that you have some. And it actually means that it can be very powerful. I don't want you to damage people. That's what I don't want. Anxiety actually means the feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease. Typically about an event or something with an uncertain outcome. I get that. But this wouldn't apply to salvation because we're not uncertain about that. You don't have to fear salvation. That's where you draw the line. Worry doesn't make you weak, less than, or not able to think for yourself. These are some stuff that we, we talk about in this group, and it, it's just amazing. Everybody can help everybody. Healthy fear saves lives. It actually can be the Holy Spirit working. It keeps us safe. The body's reaction to a situation. Can you actually control it? Do you never fear? Do you never get nervous? Never worry? Anybody? So in Philippians 4, 6, where it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present, present your request to God. Okay, so now I told you the history, right? They had lost the founder, the planter of their church. The, the person, I'm going to call him a pastor, that was actually in charge, went to be with him, and he got sick and was not coming back, and they were worried. And they sent Paul a note that said, what are we going to do? And he says, don't worry. Do you do that too? Do you just say that? It doesn't mean that you're less than if you do. Yep, we're all going to get scared. Jesus actually tells us not to worry about something, too. And it's not that broad. He actually tells us what it is. In Luke, in chapter 12, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. You see, he's telling them, don't worry. Think about their culture, right? All they had were their tents and their clothes and, and how to get food. And he's telling them, don't worry about finding food. And don't worry about shelter. Don't worry about those things. I get that. Have faith in him. He will provide for you. 
It doesn't mean that you're not going to worry about them. He's telling them to turn to me and I will provide for you. And it might get easier as time goes along. But this whole idea that, that people are not supposed to worry and they're less than a Christian if they, less of a Christian if they do, is hogwash. Well, I'm getting better with my language, aren't I? <laughs> Got to be careful. I'll clean some of you out. I want to tell you a story. Worship team can get ready. Uh, I'm just going to bail on the rest of this stuff. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. His name's Hunt, and he's a pilot. And this is how I see life. Um, Hunt has flown thousands and thousands of aisle, uh, miles and hours in a commercial big jets. And if I got on a plane, and I knew that Hunt was the pilot of that plane, I would have complete trust. I know him. I love him. He's good to me. I'm good to him. We, we have this bond. I don't think he would ever lie to me. And if he says, you know, there's going to be some turbulence today. Just want you to know, there's going to be some turbulence. But I got this. It happens all the time. Don't worry. It doesn't mean I'm not going to worry. The first time that plane drops like that, I'm going to be scared. But the guy next to me, if he said, this is bad, this is bad, we're all going to die, I can say, dude, you don't know the pilot. I, I know the pilot. He's a good guy, does this all the time. He told me that these things would happen. And you can just relax. This is what it's like to know Jesus. He's the pilot, and he's telling you it's okay. What if you were on a bus, and the road was just rough and noises and things were rattling like they were loose and you went to the bus driver and he's a good friend of yours and he says don't worry about it, it happens all the time would you still worry maybe not as much but you would trust him because he's your friend he's never lied to you before and he told you that this is normal and just go sit down and relax i got this that's jesus that's jesus in our life yeah, you might have a little worry, and the, the turbulence might get bad once in a while, but if you know the pilot, you'll understand that it's okay. Yeah, I don't like some of those feelings, that the ups and downs, and then the plane starts shaking, and I look at somebody else, and if they're nervous, I'm nervous. And you don't have to be if you know the pilot. Do you know the pilot? It's okay to be nervous a little bit. But when you know who's in control, who's driving the bus, who's flying the plane, and they told you all these things, you can relax and know that it's okay. They told me it would be this way. You ever been on a plane and in the, uh, the seat back in front of you, there's like a little card in there. I mean, one, one talks about whether you're going to puke or not, but one, some of the other ones are, are maybe about the pilot, right? So you can actually read about your pilot and where he's from, and maybe they don't do this anymore. All kinds of stuff about your pilot. Well, I want to show you the card that's in the seat back in front of you. Right? This is where you can find all about the pilot and what he tells you is going to happen. And, and don't worry. Fear not. It doesn't say everything's going to be good. It doesn't mean that you're never going to be scared. It doesn't mean that you're less of a person if you are scared. It just means that it's okay. You can relax. Do the best that you can. Because the pilot is good. And he's been through it so much. I want you to fear your sin. That's what you should fear. You should fear when you're not doing something right. That's good fear. That's good fear that'll get you back online, back in track, back in check. That's the kind of fear that you should have. There's another kind of fear that's actually really good, and that is the fear of Satan. Are you scared of him? You don't have to be, but boy, he's going to work on you. If you are an effective pilot, he is going to make the ride as turbulent as possible because he can turn you into the guy sitting next to me that said, this is bad. I don't know about your pilot anymore. You know, if they were good, they, we wouldn't be going through this turbulence. 
What can you do to make Satan tremble? You can know the pilot. You can love the pilot. You can tell people about the pilot. You can trust the pilot. You don't have to fear about the destination because he's always going to get you there. Your destination is fine. You're going to make it. There's going to be some problems along the way. And you've got your choice whether to sit back and trust the pilot and say, dude, it's all up to you. You fly the plane. I'll do the best that I can with these people back here. But you take care of the plane. You get us to where we're supposed to go. And I trust you. You see, that kind of fear, that kind of battle is not on us. That kind of battle belongs to the pilot. He's the one that has to do that. And he already has. He knows he's going to get to the destination because he's already been through that turbulence and he's already defeated that fear that we have about our destination. It's all good. You don't have to fight the battle. But if you're going to, start on your knees. If you're on a uh, turbulent plane ride, I'd like to introduce you to the pilot because it makes all the difference in the world. Matthew 10, 28. Do not, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid. Jesus is telling you this. Be afraid. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's what you should be scared about. The other stuff is very natural. But let's not get comfortable with our sin. Let's try to do better. The pilot understands, and the pilot knows that you're not perfect, and you're never going to be until you step into that next realm and have complete love. That you can be certain about. The uncertainty of this world, I get it. I deal with it all the time. But he is a good pilot. And all you got to do is get to know him. If you're on a turbulent ride right now, please talk to me. Talk to somebody. Things can be better. Things can be good. There's different ways to handle different things. But you just need to be introduced to the pilot to begin with. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. I can't imagine your son coming to this earth and letting a bunch of thugs beat him and kill him because you love us that much. That is uncomprehensible to me, but I am so glad you did. It, it brings tears to my eyes to think about what he did for me, it's being so unworthy of it, but he thought we were. God, thank you for this pilot that will get us to our destination. And it was from this day forward, we will be committed to worshiping him and praising him and tell other people to get on board. We're going for a flight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.